We've known each other a good long time. I'll say. 50 years. Yeah, maybe a little more. And I remember the first time I met you. And you have always been this heroic, singular person in my life and one of my great teachers. I'm always honored just to be able to have a discourse with you, always. And you know that, you know that, you know I love you. I wanna make sure I can hear all this. Uh, what I want you to know is, I, I wanna to talk to you as if we're not on camera. Good. However, if there's anything that I ask you that you don't wanna deal with, you just say, we'll talk about that over dinner. All right? That's better than American citizen. That's a better deal than American <laughs> citizen. Has. No, uh, that's okay. I trust you. Yeah. I spend time with you. Yeah. And your former wife. Yeah. When it was good. I went to your home um, off of uh, Benedict Canyon. Great cook. <laughs> Sheena prepared wonderful meals for us. We would, after the meal, sit on the couch and you would play m music for me on the stereo. You would put Kenton on. You would tell me, I want you to see what it means with Here Comes the Elephants. We would talk late into the night. I would leave your house on those occasions saying to myself, Mort has it made. <laughs> He's got a wife who loves him. He had three or four dogs, a couple of Dobermans, if I remember. Five. Five Dobermans that you loved, that always petrified yeah. me. You had your music. You had your home. You yeah. had your career. You had your money. And you had the respect, not only of your peers, but of your country. How could China? not have recognized your uniqueness and specialness? Well, uh, it knocked me down, first of all. I never thought that would happen. But she ran off with a terrible guy who didn't come through for her at all. She took money out of the bank and subsidized him, a horse trainer, and uh, a guy who once said to her, not only is your husband smarter than me, but your son is smarter than me. That didn't touch her at all. I don't know what happened, but she left the kid with me. There's no woman alive who does that. And uh, that poor kid raving about my cooking, you know, trying to make me feel better. But to this day, if you had her here, you'd say, what happened with Mort? She'd say, uh, he doesn't know how to be a dad, I mean an authoritarian, like her dad. That's what a woman means when she says that. What ex where do they get their examples? Not in the encyclopedia. And uh, as a result, with no notice, she went up the chimney and never came down. I was alone with him for four years till he passed away. I want to bring up a, a sad subject, a difficult subject. And you All of this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of it is actual, some of it is truthful. That's right. This is truthful. I remember when you brought your son, Mort Jr., yeah. to my house for me to meet him. Yeah. But what I need from you is the breadth and depth of a father's loss. Oh, well. Uh, and yeah. I ask it completely respectfully, Mort. You don't have to open this to the public. Well, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I got a, two cops at the door at six in the morning who found him and wanted to identify him. and. I was going on the air with Don Imus in New, on New York time. And uh, 
they had this tattoo. He had a girl's name on his arm. But he was my best friend. And ironically enough, he looked upon me as the child. He's going to shelter me from the storm all the time. And uh, he had some bad friends that didn't serve him. And uh, he had a tremendous sense of the moment. I remember Sheena cooking the front end of the house and she said, Mort Jr., tell dad dinner's getting cold. What is he doing? And she, he said, he's watching the Playboy channel, but only for the articles. <laughs> or he'd walk in while I'm watching it out. Terrible Western made in 35. And he'd say, they're not making them the way they used to, are they, Dad? <laughs> so he had a sense. And one day he came home. He had been in Tower Records in Westwood with Axl Rose and Slash. And he asked for an autograph. Mort to Mort. He said, is that your dad? He said, yeah. He said, well, he's a genius. And he came home and he treated me with a new awe. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I think uh, Axel told me he's close to editing Chinese democracy <laughs> into an LP. <laughs> That's really funny. I saw Slash at, a, uh, at CBS. He said, I really love that kid. I said, well, he sure loved you guys. And uh, his piano is here, you know, upstairs. I did not know that. On the mezzanine and uh, the Korean piano. So, uh, you know, I was my, my best friend, and I think he would have been heard from if he wasn't headed off. Uh, but uh, his mother, you know, she didn't quite know what to do with it, and the last time I really saw her was at the funeral. So. What were his ambitions? He wrote a lot of songs. He wanted to be in the music business. He had a, a band called Crash Diet, and uh, he wanted to publish the songs. And Al Sargent, the screenwriter, took some of the lyrics home. He showed him some of the lyrics he wrote. And one of the songs he dedicates to his mother. He says, you know, she's a knockout, but her arms are too short to reach the phone. A knockout, but yeah, her great arms figure are too short to reach, to reach the, phone. the phone. And that's all in rhyme and cadence and everything. So he had a, a wicked sense of humor. What do you think Mort would be doing more tune you would be doing right now? Would he be in the music business? Would he be performing? Would he be writing? Or would I don't know. Uh, I never think about in those terms of the end game, but he would now be 39. And uh, he might have, have as much trouble with it as we're having trying to figure it out. But uh, he loved hard and in a solitary way. I don't know if the, the girls are up for it anymore. I mean, he really, you know, his heart was on the line all the time. He loved hard and in a solitary kind Monogamous, of way. Monogamous, yeah. And I don't know if the girls are up for it <laughs> anymore. More, please. Yeah, I don't know if the, if a lot of them probably, his classmates probably married smart and are unmarried smart financially, uh, but that part of them grew old. Uh, he was always in love, you know, he was always on the line, you know, this is it. He told me that I had never felt about his mother the way he felt about this girl. You know, it, all the time, you know. No offense, but he really thought he, he had the patent. 
So uh, it's a cheat. Cheat was a good kid. And uh, uh, I never said I was an expert at parenting, but she faulted me and uh, she's really mad. You know, I, I sent her to the olive branch several times when I got up here. I said, no strings trip, you can see Marin. Everything doesn't answer. Birthdays, Christmas, doesn't choose to answer. So she turned into somebody else, I guess, because she was uh, extraordinary in her loyalty. But after a while, I still see her friend. Do you remember her friend, Elaine? Yeah, sure. It's Rebecca. Yeah. She's got a gallery in Los Angeles. Yes. And uh, she's a good chick. She got me through the funeral and everything. If I called her. Yeah. Haven't spoken to her in, what, 35 years. If I <laughs> called her and said I just uh, had a conversation with Mort up in uh, Mill Valley. And we were talking about the relationship. The marriage, yeah. Sir. And I asked him why you left him. And he told me what he thought. Now I'm asking you. What would she say to me? Would I don't she know. She thought a great deal of you and uh, continually, uh, you know, uh, as I told you, she said, he has great taste. <laughs> but I don't know. She feels pretty strongly about me. I mean, negatively. Do you still love her? Uh, well, I thought I did, but, and you think you can't live without them, but. I don't love what she became much. I married her twice, you know. I must have loved her. But women need a better opinion of themselves before they can be a goddess to you again. You know, do you remember the Wild Bunch, Ellie? Remember that movie? Sure. You remember when they, uh, when they blackmailed Robert Ryan to betray Bill Holden? Yep. He says to Albert Decker, how does it feel to be so goddamn right? He says, feels good. <laughs> yeah. He's winning. That's Peck and Paul, of course. But uh, I don't see in any likelihood she's been very cruel, you know, uh, and she's probably guilty, maybe. I don't know. I don't have any pictures of her around or any reminders. I've got a book back there with the, the pictures from the wedding. <laughs> she looks happy. She doesn't look like a prisoner, but God knows how she perceives it now. Would you um, elaborate on what you just said about the prerequisite to a woman recognizing or becoming the goddess within her? Would you speak a little bit more about that? Well, first of all, if you treat them like a woman, it's extremely seductive because it's a lost art in America. I mean, what's her name at Facebook? Sandra Zuckerberg, what's her name? Uh, Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mrs. Zuckerberg. that's supposed to be a woman nowadays. But they used to know when they were really, uh, you know, a love goddess in your life. but. I'm working on the 1939 movies. She became a stranger. She became extremely unforgiving, a lot of unnecessary cruelty. Asked me for whatever pictures I had of the kid, duplicate them, send them back, never send them back. So uh, she's punitive. And I guess I don't think I can bail that out. Beyond China. Yeah. Women. Yeah. Say women in America. You know, when I came back from the wake for Mort, I met Kensley, whom you know. And uh, it was all right for a while. It was good for a while. Uh, but I think America made her crazy. I think she bent on the wrong horse. And I know I can make people crazy, but I'm working toward a greater goal, a kind of an enlightenment, you know, 
And I wrote that, and I tried to sell it many times, where the woman sees the light and the guy comes through the door and all that stuff. Do you want to live or do you want to die and all that? And over the years, I saw less and less directors wanted to make it. And then, when's the last time you went to a movie? Can't remember. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I keep trying, but you know, uh, I just saw that a picture here, uh, the documentary on Brando, but they don't know how he suffered. He isn't just a character, it was, you know. You knew Brando. Yeah, you? very well. How did he suffer? Well, he didn't think he could trust anybody because he knew a lot of agents and uh, he felt like an alien in an alien country. Uh, he had just enough sensitivity. I knew Cliff too. I knew Montgomery Cliff who was more of a method actor than he was. Who said to me once, I was doing a cast party for the Misfits. Uh, John Houston brought me up. My favorite movie. You like that movie? My yeah. favorite. He's, he, I was in Reno with him and uh, I said, modestly, do I know what I'm doing? I don't know what I'm doing. And he said to me, you know exactly what you're doing. Like he, Inspector McGray had caught the perpetrator. I knew everybody on the picture. I knew Houston. You know, Houston saved the hungry yeah, about 12 times. And I knew Marilyn. Uh, but she was great. But she didn't aspire to be anything but a girl that I could say. Wait a minute. Yeah. It's a high calling. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you're talking now about Elliot's favorite movie. Honey, I just round them up and sell them to the dealer. Always have. Now, there's no need to look at me that way. Now you're looking at me like I was a stranger. Honey. I thought they were used for riding or for... Well, sure, they used to be. Well, like Christmas presents for kids because they're small horses, you see. Kids love them for Christmas. But kids ride motor scooters now. They're real strong horses, though. Little as they are. They used to breed to them for stamina. Why? There was Mustang blood pulling all the plows in the West. They couldn't have settled here unless somebody caught Mustang for them. Somehow or other, it all got changed around. See, I'm doing the same thing I always did. It's just that they changed it around. But you know what you're doing isn't right, don't you? You know that. Honey, if I didn't do it, somebody else would. I don't care about the others. You've bought food for my dog, haven't you? What did you think was in those cans? I don't want to hear it. Honey, nothing can live unless something dies. Oh, stop. Rosalind, we never kidded, you and I. Now, I'm telling you, I don't want to lose you. But you've got to help me a little bit, though, because I can't put on that this is all as bad as you make it. All I know is everything else is wages. I hunt these horses to keep myself free, so I'm a free man. That's why you like me, isn't it? I liked you because you were kind. I haven't changed. Yes, this changes it. Honey, a kind man can kill. No, he can't. Well, if it's bad, maybe you have to take a little of the bad with the good, else you'll be running for the rest of your life. What is it to stop for? You're just like everybody else. Yeah, sure. Maybe we're all alike, including you. We start out doing something, meaning no harm, something that's naturally in us to do. But somewhere along the line, it gets changed around into something bad, like dancing in a nightclub. You started out just wanting to dance, didn't you? But little by little, it turns out that people ain't interested in how good you danced it. They're squawking at you with something entirely different in their minds. And they turn us sour, don't they? I gotta look down my nose at you, too. Showing yourself off in a nightclub for so much a night. But I took my hat off to you, because I know the difference. This, this is how I dance, Rosalind. And if they make something else out of it, well, I can't run the world any more than you could. You took your hat off to me. You 
mean it. Don't you care? Casablanca's two, but The Misfits yeah. has always been uh, my film. Uh, and you knew them all. And I came to Los Angeles a year after Marilyn died, Clark Gable died. I have to ask you a couple of Misfit questions, and you know, for some of our friends, it's important. Yeah. You knew Marilyn Monroe. I did. You sat, you talked with Marilyn Monroe. You hung out with Marilyn. Yeah, she was a girl. And you said she only aspired to be a girl. That seemed like it all the time I knew her. But I never did the normal pressure with her. I used to take her down to Dolores Drive-In. Remember that? <laughs> I remember Dolores' drive-in. I'm trying to picture you and Marilyn Monroe going to Dolores' drive-in together. Please you Get me. those Susie Q fries and the yes. burgers. And she used to wear no makeup and a scarf. And I, I met her uh, through uh, Sinatra and the, and the Kennedy people. Uh, and uh, But she didn't... She didn't come across as a manipulator, you know. And there was nothing at stake there because I, I had no ambitions in that area. And Sinatra, well, he was supposed to be the toughest guy in town. Yeah. But under pressure, almost nobody is the toughest guy in town. Maybe the best artist in town. You know, if you listen to him singing... I get along without you very well. Of course I do. Boy, is that good. You know, when you get a guy restricted to the area he cares about, really great. Uh, and I recorded for him, of course, in those days. But they didn't like the direction I took. And I don't think it's the facts. I wouldn't want to make this, this thing with you about the facts. I think it's what it suggests about independence. You're supposed to turn your back on the president and walk away. <laughs> when Sheena left, I went out for a while. And uh, I went out with this uh, a columnist, a gossip columnist. You know, when you said you came to Hollywood, I was, thinking, I was gonna say to you, most of the time you spent in the balcony of the Warner Brothers Theater watching 2001. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when I was a columnist, then she said to me, well, uh, why are you so interested in Kennedy, you know? And uh, you weren't married to him or anything. She said that to me. Interesting woman's take on things. And I took her home and dumped her out of the car. I went out with her twice more, and I never shook her hand. I never kissed her goodnight. And the girl that fixed me up said, well, you have to express affection to a girl or she'll think there's something wrong with her. And I said, no, she'll say there's something wrong with me. And what do you think she said? You're not straight. I said, well, couldn't you tell how artistic I am? Why did you expect me to be ravenous toward women? You better not be ravenous because there are no women. That's the point of the story. They're really not available. Uh, they're available for financial adventures and subsidies, and, but not- There are no real women left? Oh yeah, I'm sure there are. Uh, they're probably scared to put that forward. How would you do that with text dating? How would you tell people you're a real woman? I got a, a, a better question. <laughs> How do you define a real woman? Well, what is a real woman to Mort Saul? A real woman would be someone that makes you feel optimistic, who would see things differently than you, perhaps in another dimension. A real woman. 
A real one could tell the difference between a larcenous kid and one who was scared. That kind of, you know, Gina's problem, actually. She was very smart, as you recall, but she was raised by somebody who was authoritarian. So she thought parenting was being authoritarian. Anybody can do that. Tell me another quality or two about what would constitute a She was artistic. She was a sculptor and a painter and everything. But there's a whole part of her that equates with a brutal guy as an in-charge guy. That's her father. I hate to sound like a Freudian at this late hour. But uh, my mother was very loving. And as a result, that's all I was looking for in the women was home, home, try and fashion a home. It eluded me, uh, I'm sorry to announce. But, you know, when I talk, I talk about the same stuff to the people I trust. When I talk to Lucy about this, she says, you can tell people anything, but what do you tell your heart? She's right. I don't know why she knows that. But what do you tell your heart? Uh, what do you say to your heart? Well, there's always the temptation to feel lonesome and abandoned. That's the danger. You know, when I used to fly before uh, uh, we got the Internet, I used to carry the official airline guide. <laughs> so, and Warren Beatty came to my hotel and he said to me, you have a great fear of being abandoned. <laughs> that came from uh, Dr. Uh, what's his name down there? Kranzdorf, what was the guy? I know the doctor. Yeah, yeah. What was the most surprising thing that Marilyn Monroe ever said to you? What was the thing that she said that surprised you? You know, she spent a fortune defending Miller. Yes. Her whole personal fortune. Yes. And she never quibbled. She never paused. I mean, that's my guy. And so she had a dream, an idealized dream of love. He's the, the coldest guy in the world, you know, cold. And his friend was, uh, his best friend was, uh, who was that writer who wrote uh, Lie Down in Darkness? Styron. Yes, Styron. William Styron, who was also cold. And two guys who both made fun of people who followed the Kennedy assassination. Cold. I don't know how they wrote so well, but they're cold guys. You know, Connecticut intellectuals. The kind that torture women like Philip Roth and Claire Bloom. They torture women if they find that they, they're partial to them. Uh, and it shrinks, you know, log a lot of time on that. Claire Bloom was in the Jerry Lewis picture. Splendid them, really splendid. Why would Monroe find herself with JFK, RFK, Arthur Miller, Joe DiMaggio, and Sam Giancana? Well, <laughs> what, what is the well, Let me tell you what happened at the crescendo during the Democratic Convention. Okay. I walked out. I like to show when it's not prepped. Yes. So I walked out and I said, look at this headline. Marilyn Monroe is going to marry Adlai Stevenson. I said, then Kennedy can be jealous of him twice, which made him a pretender to the nomination. And he hit the table so hard it resonated through the club. And he said, God damn it, there he goes again. It's a meaning I'm not trustworthy. But the truth of the matter is, uh, sometimes you can learn a lot by the opportunity I had to meet those people. I learned a lot from Richard Burton, knew a lot about people, knew a lot about literature. All the English actors, uh, Burton, Trevor Howard, Peter O'Toole, all could drink all night and go to work. Yep. <laughs> Nobody in Hollywood, they all go to rehabilitation. <laughs> oh man. But that's when I was cooking with all those people. And uh, why was she with all those guys? who appeared on the surface to be different kinds of guys. 
Well, I don't know that she was with the Kennedys. In other words, I have bits and pieces, but I knew Joe, you know. Joe really loved her, but he had the kind of expectations I do, which is TV trays and television. And she wanted something more forthcoming. Good guy, great guy. He was like a mensch. And uh, there isn't much demand for that these days. And, and then she got mixed up with those intellectuals at the Actors Studio. I didn't really know her that well. You know, it's kind of on the fringe. I wasn't even invited to the inauguration. I wrote in there for a year, and I wasn't invited to it. I'm going to ask one more Monroe question, yeah. and then no more. Yeah. How did she die? I don't know. Uh, I do know that Peter Lawford and Milt Evans, who are both our managers, and maybe Paul Ziffrin, went to the apartment to sanitize it before the cops came. And I do know that the LA police are not that curious. Captain Danny Bowser, who was in charge of uh, the Polanski case. Got it. And when I asked about RFK, he said to me, do yourself a favor, stay away from it, which is just what I want to hear, of course. So he had the wrong guy. And I met him through Jack Newman, who wrote Police Story at Columbia, who saved my soul and taught me to write that stuff fast. Great guy, by the way. Great guy, you know. And uh, he, he could write people. And I worked for him at uh, Paramount Television and MGM Television when I was first starting to write. But you can't cure yourself. The stuff I wrote was idealized, you know. And something funny there happened. You know, I, I was working for Mel Simon. Do you remember him? Simon was, uh, he's the guy that invented the mall in Indianapolis. And <laughs> He got enough money, so he opened a studio. Yes. And he, uh, I wrote a movie for him, and they bought it, and then they cast me in the lead with Natalie Wood. Then they had a meeting, and they said, you know, Mort's never really acted in anything of any length. And, uh, so they called me in in the morning, and they said, you're no longer the lead in the picture. We're going to use James Garner, but before you resist, we want you to direct the picture. So I said, you mean because I have no talent as a passenger, I can be the pilot of this plane? <laughs> well, the joke appealed to me. None, neither came true. But anyway, she was a great chick, Natalie. Do you get tired of being asked who killed Kennedy? No, they don't. They try and avoid it. Uh, one of the tweets I got on Periscope this week was, you keep saying they did it. Who is they? I don't get any questions that direct. Nor normally it's, uh, will you please go away? Because uh, uh, encapsulated in the question is the guilt that they didn't do anything. I mean, if they didn't try Cheney after that war, when are they ever going to do anything? It doesn't look promising. No, I, n I never got that. Uh, they'd say, they used to say to me, can you prove that? Well, how do we prove it? Everybody Garrison found worked for the federal government, including Oswald. You know, and, uh, but that was a, a creative time. I had a lot of close friends down there. You know, I was an assistant DA. I was a colonel in the sheriff's office. People question my credentials as a comedian. <laughs> Those aren't so, you know. We talked about this when we first met 50 years ago. And I have a, a, a tape on my jukebox on the website. And I asked you straight out, who killed JFK? And we had established your credentials working with Jim Garrison. Yeah. We had established your credentials as being a absolute legitimate investigator. You deposed people. You were on the trail. 
Yeah. You know the names and you know the secrets. Yeah, the CIA killed the president. They killed the president because he indicated by aborting the Bay of Pigs that he was going to emasculate the spending of that money with LeMay. And so the CIA got larger and larger after he was sworn in. He even says in the office, not on my watch. But everybody we found, uh, DeMar and Shield and uh, Oswald worked for the FBI, and uh, all the lo lawyers were paid by the CIA at one time in Columbus, Ohio, to defend Clay Shaw, who also worked for the CIA. They're running the country. That's why Dianne Feinstein can't say anymore. And we invited them aboard on his watch. About how many shooters were in Dallas, Texas? Well, the shooters were over the grassy knoll. And there's about five guys back there. Because there's, a, uh, there's three bullets out of there. And then there's uh, a bullet in the sidewalk where they missed. And then there's three guys who say they're Secret Service men and aren't. And we even have photographs of General Lonsdale from the CIA leading guys out in synthesized uh, Dallas police uniforms. And all of this is in, uh, I have Garrison's unpublished book, by the way. You ever want to read that? Couldn't get it published. I and, would like to read that. Yeah, and uh, Continue that. you notice that Oliver Stone never got any of this, never had lunch with me, nothing. Dismissed Ken Lee, who had him on a flight. He said, why don't you talk to Mort? He said, well, Garrison's got enough enemies. Well, how did I distinguish myself as an enemy? I uh, cashed in my career for that. This surprises me. I did not know that Oliver Stone uh, did, did not no. have a conversation with you. No. Uh, is it fair to say that if somebody who's watching us tonight, who's 35 years old, who would like to know who killed the president, if they watched JFK, the Oliver Stone movie, is that pretty close? Well, conjecturally, but why wouldn't Stone have lunch with me? That was my second question. I mean, well, you, well, I, <laughs> the, the first one before the lunch question yeah. is whether or not that Be, was the depiction of what Because you're... all of that, we went to court, we took the whole Oswald thing apart. And when Oswald was arrested, you know, there's no cell phones then. In his wallet, he has the unlisted number of the head of the FBI office in Dallas in his wallet. So, uh, you know, and then the witnesses kept dying and we went to court and, and they tried to demonize Garrison, of course. If you were allowed to present the evidence that you wanted to present in court yeah. during the Clay Shaw trial, if you were allowed what would have been the most damaging? I would give everybody a copy of On the Trail of the Assassins by Garrison. <laughs> Just read it. The names are all in there. And also Fletcher Prouty, who's on YouTube. All of Prouty, uh, the secret team, in which he talks about a high cabal, as Churchill put it, who decides who's going to lead the world. You're the kind of people Charlie Rose knows. <laughs> All too well, I sense. Did Bobby Kennedy have an emissary that went to Jim Garrison and say, if I'm elected president? I'll get the guys? Yeah. No. What he had was, a, first he sent down uh, Frank McGee from NBC News to discredit Garrison. Then he sent in uh, uh, 
I, what was the guy's name? He worked at the Justice Department who came down there to discredit Garrison. And then he told me, if you keep talking about conspiracy, it's guaranteed, you're guaranteed to lose the election. And I said, that isn't all you're going to lose. I saw him. And he came to hate me, but that's all right. Uh, I'd rather he were alive, but Jim Garrison sent a message to him saying, if you win California, you won't live to get to the convention. And then Bobby said, well, am I going to listen to some Southern cracker cop and nightclub comedian? Are going to listen to my trusted staff, all of whom were, uh, you know, uh, uh, the National Security Advisor for Kennedy, the Harvard guy, and Arthur Schlesinger, and uh, Kenneth Galbraith, all of whom were cynics. So they had a field there. And he was a very cynical guy. RFK. Yeah, oh yeah. McCarthy, you know, was much more effective. He goes to New Hampshire and Johnson quits. <laughs> McCarthy was great, you know, but he had a lot of fiber, had that Catholic fiber and a great sense of humor, you know. How much does, did Ted Kennedy know? I don't know. Uh, the last time I saw him was in New York. And <laughs> the Benet Brith gave him an award. <laughs> and uh, I walked into the hotel with Pat, Lawford's wife. It's funny about America. They spent years avoiding me, but she brings me in. And he looked at me and he turned gray and he said, Mort, I can't tell you what it means to see you again. In other words, I was supposed to be in the wax museum. Uh, but uh, they may have killed him because he was the last of the Klan, and the uh, autopsy on John Jr. was forbidden by him. He cremated the bodies and discouraged any inquisition by the government authorities. And then he says he has his brain tumor. Then he appears with a full head of hair. Then he's dead. No autopsy again. And that was the end of the Democratic Party. Well, I knew him pretty well, you know. And I, you run into them, you know. I walked into a museum at 73rd of Madison one day, and there's Jackie looking at this vase. And I looked at her, and she said to me, I know, I know. <laughs> so there's really no getting away from him. What succeeded him is pretty day class A, I would say. Will we ever see the files, the secret files, the unrevealed files. I don't know if there'll ever be any demand again. Your life to relive again. <laughs> if you could rewrite the script, what singular change would you have changed in the pursuit of your destiny? A domestic fascism, in other words, uh, hacking uh, and listening to everybody and recording it all, having made this into 1984, so that there are, are no options. America was the last place you had options. And they take to the authoritarianism all too well. Well, they must be knowing what they're doing or they wouldn't be there. You know, look at Obama, look what a lie that all is. I mean, the liberals sold that thing wholesale, Black Lives Matter. Well, he's not your average black guy, and neither is Sharpton. And, and I saw that all put together in Chicago. You know, I did a dinner back there for Kerry. The Democrats hired me. John Kerry. And I could see it was rigged then. Well, the honest guy in the party was Edwards. John Edwards. John Edwards. Was the honest guy in the party because? Uh, because he meant it. He meant it about the economy and everything. I think they entrapped him. I think, uh, to make it uh, the brief version, I think they entrapped Gary Hart. I think they entrapped Edwards with the girl. And they forced him to quit so that inevitably it would go the other way and the party played the race card, and now it's trying to play the gender card. Not too successfully. 
Oh, yeah. That's all they trust now is a steady hand on, on the throttle. But they're wrong because they're going to go broke. That's the irony of it. It's not virtue. They're going to run out of money. Now, I had a joke here on the show in which uh, Stallone and Jason Statham yes. and Schwarzenegger make a movie in which they're going to knock off Fort Knox. Yes. And they burrow in underground. And when they get there, Ron Paul is standing there and he says, I told you there was no gold here. <laughs> Nobody would laugh. The joke got retired honorably. <laughs> Nobody would laugh. It's too true. Uh, that's when a joke is too good. There is such a thing as a joke that's too good. The audience is not in practice. Uh, that's another area that's been vacated in America. There is no comedy. There is no drama. The audience is not in practice. Tell me more about it. Well, all they see, a guy came up to me last week on my Thursday show and he said to me, well, one might say that you're the father of stand-up. And I said, I want a paternity test. <laughs> I don't want to be credited with those yo-yos. Boy, I got to tell you, if I see one more guy texting in a crosswalk, the black comedians bully the audience, which is already playing defense. And the vulgarization, straight out of Compton, they're not reaching very high, you know? Look at the madness of taking a black guy out of any area and putting the name of it, your city on his shirt and then cheering for him in a bar. Look at the madness of all that. And the old American madness was funny. You know, Mr. Deeds goes to town. The madness of how a guy can still believe in love when he's been run over by a freight car, a good looking dame, that's funny already. But this stuff is, you know, movies with Kevin Hart and, and uh, Will Ferrell. I mean, give me a break. It's a discreditation. Those people on Saturday night are scared. They're all scared. The network now belongs to uh, Lauren Michaels. And there's nothing, there's nothing to watch there. Again, I mean, when did you watch television that night? What's the news? You look at 60 Minutes. And sometimes you look at Dancing with the Stars. What passes for news? <laughs> yeah. 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 I didn't understand. If somebody refers to you as the father of stand-up comedy. Yeah. <laughs> they mean it as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> Why does that offend you? Uh, because the product. I mean... Uh, I see what it became. They don't, they don't venture forward with anything. How y'all doing tonight? And that's the end of it. And then some kind of tired profanity and uh, no nobility. In other words, it doesn't have to be intellectual. I thought Burl was funny. I thought Skeleton was funny. I thought Hope was funny. But they don't aspire to that. Uh, in fact, it's very... Um, uh, in vogue to knock hope now. They should be that good. They should be that good. The guy was in touch with what's going on. And he was a, a real conservative. He was the real thing. Yes. Just like Duke Wayne, you know. Did you know that today, as we tape, is the anniversary of the passing of Groucho Marx? No, I didn't. But I was at KQED when he was arrested. Did I tell you that? He no. did a special down there. Tell me the story. He did a special, and uh, he took questions Yes. from PBS. And a guy said, do you have any idea how to make this a better country? And he said, you can start by killing Nixon. And the Secret Service came into the wings and arrested him. And uh, I knew him pretty well in the beginning, yeah. And uh, I knew him when he was doing summer theater 
in Chicago when I was working there. And I don't have the fascination for them that the comedians do. I mean, Woody and Cabot and those guys. I don't. I think the writers were pretty smart. You know, uh, George, George Kaufman and Maury Riskin was the only right winger among the writers, but he's a good writer. But the general chaos of them, uh, I don't know. It doesn't wear that well for me. I was very good friends with him, with Groucho. I know a lot of the old guys.